to see everybody, and uh, especially our visitors, those that are with us, first time, second time, third time. We're glad you're here. Uh, as Pastor Stephen mentioned, there's connect cards, there's ways to get involved uh, with Life Church, and we just we do that because we want you to know and stay informed. But also, uh, we're very thankful for what God has blessed us with. And when you come to this place, when you find this dead end street next to this railroad track, um, just know it, it's, it's not about the, the the glitz and the glamour for us. But we are focused on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, we we love community together, and we don't just preach and talk about the Bible. We preach the Bible. Um, and so that is our focus here, and, and in doing that and centering everything on Christ, everything on his word, that is the springboard from which we inform everything else, and that is Life Church in, in a nutshell. Another way that we try to seek to, uh, tell me if I need to switch on this mic here, um, we try to foster community as we make sure that we do things that, um, that help keep our focus. And as Pastor Stephen was mentioning earlier, prayer is one of the ways that we do that. And so what we're going to start doing is the first Wednesday of every month, starting in September, we're going to have a time of prayer right here. It's going to be the first Wednesday of every month. And uh, to get my times right, 545 to 615, 30 minutes of prayer. And and Pastor William's going to be here to lead some worship. And so just a time to refocus our hearts, to get centered on what Christ, his will is for the church, his will is for ourselves And you can't go wrong in doing that. So prioritize that if you can. Um, If you can make that out, please come. 545, we'll have in the announcements and the emails, all that great stuff. So we're going to start doing nights of of prayer. Um, Also, as Pastor Steve mentioned, the life groups outside, please go just check that out. Get some information. If you're kind of on the line, want to figure it out, just go talk to somebody. Uh, It'd be a great chance to get involved there, see what next steps look like. On a practical note, when you guys come in on Sunday mornings, if you do me a favor and just move to the center aisles, you don't have to do it now, but next week, move to the center of the aisle so that folks, when they come in, they can find somewhere to sit. It's not hard to do because when we're standing in worship, it's really hard to find seats uh, from the back. So just move to those center aisles. That will help us tremendously. Last announcement. I don't think I've ever gotten to make this announcement before, but I get to do it today. There is somebody who is a member of our church who is now engaged. And it is Avery in the very back. She is engaged to Zach. Fantastic. She's showing it off. Yeah, that's right. She's showing that bling off. She's like, yeah, that's right. And Zach right here, throw your hand up, Zach. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You did it, man. You, Yeah, way to go. So how'd you do it? How'd you do it? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's going to be the next question from here until y'all get married is how, how did you do it? How did you engage and uh, get it, get proposed? So excited for y'all. Thank God for that. So let me pray for us, and we will press into the Word of God together. So God, thank you, Lord, for this moment. God, thank you that we get to come together under one name, the name that saves, the name that heals, that delivers, that sets free, the only name by which we can be saved, and that is the name of Jesus. And so God, today, in this moment, in this time, on this day that we've never seen before, that we will never see again, God, speak to us clearly through your word. God, that's why we're here. That is the purpose of the gathering, Lord, is to see you, God, through scripture and through singing and to focus our hearts on eternal matters. And God, as we press into the scriptures today, God, I'm sure it'll be something that many have heard before, but may we actually hear for the first time through the lens of faith, through the lens of expectation, God, through the lens of wanting to hear your voice very clearly as to how it will change and conform our lives more to the image of your son. That is the purpose of our gathering. God, use these moments to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. If you agree with that, say amen. 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 Take your Bibles. Go to James. James chapter 4. We've got a, a few more sermons in this series. It's titled The Effects of Faith. And we'll track on through. And I just, I want to issue a challenge to you all to, to hang in here with us. Keep coming. Try not to miss a Sunday for the next several Sundays. Because if you miss it, you're going to miss something. Something very important. Something very uh, necessary for your growth, for your development, for your spiritual walk. So try to make commitments to come on, hang in here. Don't miss a Sunday. If you have to miss, uh, catch it online. You can catch it in our uh, recordings on our YouTube channel. But just hang in here with us because this is, we're approaching the finish line. But I'm telling you, you're just so, so good. So good. So we've talked about this before, but in James, James is 
intensely practical. It's, it's, it's hitting the nail right on the head of where you live. It's the basics of, hey, if you need wisdom, ask God, right? It's the basics of if you're, you're going through things and you're struggling through what's next, what's the next steps. We, we, we learn the importance of faith, of trusting in Christ, of our faith, exuding things from our life that represent our relationship with Jesus. Very practical things in nature. Talked about taming the tongue. How do we honor Christ with how we speak? How do we honor Christ with how we treat one another? And today we get to a text that is also intensely practical. And remember that James is a pastor. James was a pastor of the Jerusalem church. And as a good pastor, he wants to shepherd his people in the areas of their life that are struggling. And so he hits this particular topic in James chapter 13, and I'll read it for us. He said, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So may the Lord bless the hearing and the doing of his, his word. Deo Valente. Deo Valente is a Latin phrase. I don't know if anybody here speaks Latin, um, but hopefully you can verify what I'm saying is true. But Deo Valente is a Latin phrase that means God will rule. Deo Valente. 16th century Puritans, when they were coming to America to settle, they would often write letters. And at the end of those letters, as they would write them to each other, write them to their neighbors, write them and send them back home, they would sign it at the end with a D.V. D.V. And what they would say in that letter is basically with that D.V. is that all I'm writing is, is good and well. These are our plans. This is what's happening. This is what's going on. But I got to qualify, summarize all that I've just said with a D.V. at the end, which means Deo Valente, which means God willing. Because I can say all this stuff, but if it is not the Lord's will, then it won't happen. So I'm going to make my plans. I'm going to put this stuff out there, but I'm going to sign it with a Deo Valente. Now, as you continue through time, you get to the 17th century, and you see this on letters often that are signed D.V. But as you continue on to the latter part of the 17th century, you get to the Industrial Revolution, And you actually find that the D.V. begins to fade away because with the Industrial Revolution comes man's ability to create machinery, to go further, faster, to have more ingenuity. And we begin to get to a place in society where we figure, hey, we can do this. We can make our own plans. We can create our own future. And we don't really need Deo Valente. And you see it begin to fade from a Deo Valente to a different understanding of promptus sum, which means I'm willing instead of God willing. And you don't see that DV stamped on many correspondence anymore. I don't know if you've seen this on any current letters or not, but I think we need to bring the D.V. back. I think we need a day of Valente. If, if God is willing, then it will be. And we're going to exposit that in Scripture. Now, it's easy to read the text that I just read this morning. And walk away with a bit of confusion after reading this whole idea of of making plans and and them happening if if the Lord is willing. You can be confused from that and walk away saying, well, does God not want me to plan out anything? Now, for some of y'all, that would be great news because you hate planning stuff out, right? You're a go-of-the-flow kind kind of person. You know, whatever will be, will be. You're always on island time. You're like, don't bring me a calendar. Bring me some Kool-Aid because I'm chilling, Right? The whole idea of planning something out stresses you out. Somebody comes to you, start talking about plans, start talking about what do we got to do, what's next, what's next, and you're like, just chill, because I don't know, and I don't need to know. Whatever will be, will be. That's, that's a good bit of us. I'll slightly raise my hand on that. But the question is, what is James saying, right? Is it a bad thing to plan? So let me help us this morning. What James is addressing is, is not the issue of planning, Planning in and of itself, in, in most instances, is a very good thing. It's necessary. You need to do those things. I even thought about John Wesley. John Wesley, he was the English theologian. He was an evangelist. Uh, he was a leader in the, the revival movement within the Church of England that brought about the Methodist movement. 
And John Wesley used to plan out his day in 20-minute segments. That he made sure that there, was, there, there wasn't a period of a third of an hour that he wasn't addressing the matters of the kingdom. That's how planned out he was. So James isn't saying that making plans is wrong or that it is unhelpful in any kind of way, but he is confronting this idea of presumption. He is confronting this tendency on the part of men and on the part of women to to act in such a way that suggests that we can safely make all of these plans without any reference to God and leave him out of the equation. Now, contextually for James, James is in, in first century, and it was very custom within his day to engage in, in trade, right? It was it was people would carry goods from one city to another. This is how you made your living, this is how you took care of your family. James is preaching to a predominantly Jewish congregation. They would have traded in the regions of Sidon. They would have traded in Caesarea and Crete and Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica. They would have been in the areas of Rome, Corinth. They would have traveled all of these areas, Asia Minor. So it's very traditional for them to go from one place to another. It was a mercantile life of a lot of people in the congregation. But he also saw the way in which people made and talked about their plan. James knows that he's got to confront this glaring problem within his congregation. So he writes verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. So if you break down verse 13, just look at the detail for a second. Look at the detail of planning. When you look at the when, the when is today or tomorrow. The where is to such and such a city. The period of time is spend the year there. The what is engage in business. The purpose is to make a profit. Now, you may look at this and say, man, that's that's pretty impressive because I don't know what's happening 30 minutes from now. I don't know. It's going to be a debate in the car when we leave here, but we're going to eat because we can't figure it out. Right. But the problem revealed in this passage is it is noticeably secularistic in mindset. And that is a mindset that excludes the notion of God and God's will. So James is addressing the individual who plans with an absence of dependency on God. That is the problem. Planning is not the problem. It's the absence of dependency on God in your planning that is the problem. It's the presumptuousness. It is is based on our ability to achieve and to plan And we make no reference to the frailty of the one who's making the plans. What he's saying is, I I want you, you folks who are tempted to say, we've got this figured out, and, and tomorrow I've got that in my grasp, and I have tomorrow under my control. He says, I want you to think about what you're saying for a second. Think about the way you framed your plans, and there was a rebuke for the kind of individual, the kind of heart that lives and makes plans, Apart from a consistent awareness of the hand of God and with an underestimation of your own limitations. And here's the limitations in verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. That is the limitation that all of us face. Your life life is but a a mist, but a vapor. So there's two factors about the future, and here are the two factors, the two facts about future. One is that God knows the future. The second is that we don't know the future. That's deep, ain't it? God knows the future, and you don't. That's two facts. God does, and you don't. And James points out the fact that we don't know the future by saying, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And I began to think about this for a second and sit on this and think about it. And it led me to two more concluding facts that uncertainty about the future, they should do for us. So since we don't know what the future holds, here's two things that that, that that ought to do for us. For one, it should humble us. It should humble us that you don't know the future. In chapter 4, verse 6, James already told us 
that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He comes back again in verse 10, and he says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And to further this point in verses 11 and 12, we looked at this last week, he warns against the arrogance of making yourself a judge when that seat is only reserved for God. And now we see the arrogance of making plans without reference to God. So it should humble us to recognize that we don't know anything about the next second that the future holds. Not a thing. One flat tire, one flight delayed, one sickness, one wreck, one left turn instead of a right turn, one false accusation, one public revealing of your sin, and then all of a sudden, the, we're going to go do this, and we will spend this amount of time, and we're going to carry on business, and we'll make money, and we'll do this, and we'll do that. All of a sudden, it is blown to pieces. In one second, what you thought is no longer the case. In one second. We can't control that. So number one, uncertainty about the future, it should absolutely humble us. But then secondly, uncertainty about the future should also help us. It should help us. I believe that the future is hidden from us ultimately for our good. I believe that. And I've had to get to a place to where that made sense to me because there's a lot of things in the future that I I, I, I worry over, I stress over. I don't think I'm alone in that. But I had to understand that the nature of not understanding the next seconds of this moment or tomorrow or next week or next month, it's got to help me in some kind of way for my good. For one, it is good that we don't know all of the good that awaits us down the road, down the future. Why? Why is it good that we don't know all of the good that awaits us? Well, possibly because we might become prideful in that. We could miss out on being disciplined in this moment because we know something good is coming down the road. We might fail to wake up every morning saying, God, I've got to trust you for this moment right here. We might fail to wake up and say, God, I need you for this daily bread in this moment. We might even say, well, I know the good that's going to happen then. So I don't really care about what happens right now. And on the flip side, Just like we believe that it's not good for us to know all the good, on the flip side, it is also good that we don't know all the hardships that await us. Our disappointments that lie ahead. That we don't know about our stumblings that lie ahead, our fears, our failures, our bereavements, our heartaches, our our illness. You might say, hey, I, I want to know the future. I want to know what lies ahead, but if you had that wish granted, I guarantee you, you would want to take it back. So we must learn to rejoice in our our ignorance, despite this desire to want to know, because we want to control. And if we're honest, the reason that we want to know is so that we can control. So we can we can fix it, we can alter it, we can adapt it, we can change it. You know, I was. Um, so I'm, a, I'm a, a trustee for New Orleans Seminary, and I have to go out there twice a year uh, at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And so when I'm in the town, uh, I get to enjoy the food, right? I get to go and, and eat beignets and etouffee and crawfish and all the good stuff, and I cannot wait to go back again. Um, but I had a chance to go uh, downtown area, okay? So Bourbon Street, all that crazy stuff. And, and when you're walking the streets, you see all kind of things in New Orleans. I don't know if y'all been there before. It is kind of crazy, right? And so as I'm walking, there are, there's, there's psychics out, there's opportunities to, to read tarot cards, there's all kinds of stuff. And I thought about that, and I just did a little research and said, you know, I wonder what the, the profit industry for um, psychic endeavors is, and it blew me away. The projected profit for 2024 in the whole psychic industry is $2.4 billion. billion. That's psychics, that's mediums, that's tarot cards, that's all that type of stuff. The desire to have someone read them for us to discover our horoscope, to have someone read our palms, to want to see around the corner 
to want to see beyond the veil, this desire to know what's ahead. Let me see the unseen. It is sinful. It doesn't honor God. It doesn't place God as sovereign over your future, and you should stay away from it. Stay away from it. So in verses 13 and 14, it tells us to to presume upon the future is is absolutely foolish, and, and our inability to know the future is a fact. We don't know it. And there's another portion of verse 14 that asks us a question, and then it actually answers the question for us. And the question is, what is your life? Verse 14 asks, what is your life? For you are a mist, it answers it, you are a mist that appears for a, lot, for a little time and then vanishes. I think James chapter 1, verse 10 and 11 give us even more insight to this. It says, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat that it withers the grass. Its flower fails and its beauty appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And in the context of that, and even before that, it's not just talking about the rich. It also addresses the the poor. But the, the concept of that is that the things that we might count as being unfading, unwavering, will always sustain us. The scriptures say, man, I don't want to get it. That will fade away as well. We will all fade away. And the question is, what is, is your life? And here's the realities for us, y'all, that what we do occupationally, we put so much time and effort into. You put education behind it, skill behind it, time behind it, sweat, tears, all of that, and you're very good at what you do. But the reality is if you check out, if you leave this earth, they will replace you. They will find somebody else to do what you do, and they'll keep it moving. I love this church. I love all of you. But if the Lord calls me home, y'all going to find another preacher. You're going to find somebody else to stand up here and preach the word of God, and you're going to keep going. You're going to be sad, I hope. <laughs> but you're going to keep going. What is life? What is life? What, what is it? The world keeps going. It keeps spinning. It keeps moving. What is life? And this is why arrogance and pride are so detestable to God. To think that we have it all figured out and all it takes is one thing to totally derail what we were so sure about. So I oftentimes, uh, I I buy several flights throughout the year for travels and and, and places I got to go. And I always travel with, with, with Delta because they're pretty pretty consistent, you know, pretty tried and true. Uh, so Delta is, is who I stick with. So whenever I, I make my flights and everything, there's always this opportunity through the process of purchasing, purchasing your flight, uh, and this opportunity is called the Delta Travel Protection Plan. Anybody heard of that before? Yeah, so the Delta Travel Protection Plan, they always offer it to you, and it's always in bold letters right in the middle of the page saying, hey, here's, and here's what it says. Your vacation is an investment of time and money. Delta vacations help protect your investment from the unexpected. And so they have a box to check there, and they say, do you want to protect your trip? Do you want to protect your flight? And you can check that box. And every time I see that box, guess what I do? I don't check it. I don't check that box. Because for one, it costs a little bit extra money, and I'm as cheap as I'll get out. So I ain't, you're not getting any money, more money out of me. And so I don't check that box. And And in the midst of it, I'm also thinking nothing's going to go wrong with my flight. Nothing at all. I'm going to make it. It's going to be fine. Everything's going to be great. Yeah, if you don't check the box, they run a guilt trip on you. They do. Because here's what happens next, right? You you get to click, you know, I do. I I don't want to check it. But it doesn't just say no thanks. You have to literally check the box that says this. I do not want to protect my investment of fill in the blank towards my flight and be wise with my money, and guard against the unexpected, and not be stupid. Like, that's what it says. That's what it says. And you're choosing to check that box, all right? It's a guilt trip. I'm telling you, go read it. It's right there, okay? And it's not just one prompt, because when you go through that page, right, you go to check out, then it flashes again. Are you sure you don't want to protect this trip? Are you positive? 
I ignore it again. The reason I click no is because I'm certain that nothing is going to happen. Nothing. Now, here's a confession, y'all. I should click yes. I really should click that box because I was thinking, like, year to date, I think I've missed or had to change five flights from the unexpected happening. I need to check that box. I really do. But I don't because in that moment, I assume nothing is going to happen. But the travel protection is good for your flight because it protects yourself if you can't make that flight, if you have to click the no. And it's also good for your life to have a protection here. So do you know what your travel protection plan is for your life? It's verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live, we will do this, or we will do that. That is the travel protection plan for your life. That is the day of your making. And I thought about this even in a very practical sense. Like, what if what if my kids came up to me and, and had all these plans and said, yeah, I'm on I'm going to go do this and go do that. I'm going to go eat with my friends. I'm going to go up the street and hang out with my friend. I'm going to go do this and make all these plans. And, and, and they're just telling me what they're going to do. And my next questions are, well, how are you going to get there? Because you can't drive. And let's say you, you do get there. What, what money are you going to use to get what you need to get? Because you ain't got no money. You broke, all right? And on top of that, with what permission have I granted you to do what your plans say you're going to do? How crazy would that be for my five-year-old to come to me and tell me all of his plans? And he can't make none of them happen. Be crazy. And in Scripture, we we see an example of, of Paul where he, he let this play out. He let Deo Valente be the true course of his path. And and if the Lord wills it is what he used so many times in his in his ministry. In Acts 18, 21, Paul, he was asked to stay longer in Ephesus to teach God's word for a little bit longer. And he had to leave, but he said, I'm coming back, God willing. In Romans 1, 10, he was writing to some believers in Rome, and, and he wants to come to them, and he wants to visit them. And he writes, one of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing to come at last to see you. He's hoping to visit some, some Christians in, in Corinth, and he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 19, I will come and soon if the Lord allows. At the end of 1 Corinthians, he tells the believers one more time in Corinthians 16, 7, this time I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord allows. And we see something similar in Philippians two nineteen when Paul writes, If the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Because if if the Lord wills, because I know that this is this is God, if this is his plan, is if if this is what he wants to happen, what he wants to be accomplished, it will be accomplished. I'm gonna make good plans, but do good things. Paul is doing ministry, he's planting churches, he's discipling folks, he's sending people to the churches, and it's all great, but he finishes it with if the Lord allows. If God is willing. Even in our best efforts, even in our greatest plans, God willing. And we can't see all of God's purposes, and, and that, I believe, is a mercy within itself. But we can see that which God has chosen to reveal. And when we say, if the Lord wills, we're not moving immediately, immediately into this realm of the, the unknown. And I need you to hear this clearly, because if the Lord wills, it is not synonymous with, I don't know God's will. Okay, just because we say, if the Lord's will, we don't also get to follow it with saying, well, I don't know what God wants. We, 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 can't, we can't always say that, because God, in his revelation of himself, that has been identified for us through certain things on how we ought to live and regulate our lives and our decisions and our actions and our attitudes, God has revealed certain things, and we call this the revealed will of God. I would encourage you to write that down, God's revealed will or the revealed will of of God. These are things that God has revealed very clearly to us, that God has revealed in Scripture that we see very clearly about his will and what he desires from us. See, if God's will for me is that I am to be holy, 
that I know that it is not his will for me to be unholy. Right? I, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what happens in the next moment. But I do know what God's will is concerning this. So I don't ever get a pass on saying, well, God has allowed me to do something that creates unholy behavior. Never. Because his revealed will is that we be holy even as he is holy. That, that's, that's revealed. That's, that's clear. That's not changing. If it is God's will for me to be content, then I know that it is not his will for me to be discontent. It's his revealed will. If it's God's will for me to, to tell others about Jesus, to be missiological, then, then I know that I can't justify feelings of trying to please myself and be reserved and hang back and not tell others about Jesus. God's revealed that we are to go to all the world and proclaim the gospel. It's revealed will. Now, alternatively, not all of God's revealed will answers all of our questions because then we get into his providential will. Revealed will, and then his providential will. And we face decisions in our lives that will be major decisions, big time stuff. And in those decisions, you've got equal choices, and both of them are equally moral. There's no issue with that. Neither of them have a clear violation of God's revealed will. And it's in those circumstances that most of us will find it very difficult to discern what is God wanting? What is God asking me to do in, in these decisions? My advice to you, when you find yourself in the difficulty of those decisions, here's my advice to you. Wait. Wait. Just wait. To wait upon the Lord. Especially if you're like me and you're accustomed to making very hasty decisions. Very quick decisions. Wait. Be still. Kneel down so that you can look up. Wait. Wait. Remind yourself that, that God won't lead you against his will. He, he won't lead you against his way to recognize that there is also wisdom in, in the multitude of, of counselors and the multitude of people that you trust in your disciple relationships and your life group. There's wisdom in that as well. And so you explore the avenues. You talk to somebody else that's got some discernment and some wisdom that can help pray you through that thing. And I've also discovered this in my life that if you walk in a place of obedience to where God grants you something and you've been faithful in the few things, God will put opportunities before you. And then it's not always that it's, this is the route. Sometimes there are several routes, but what God is requiring from you is obedience and faithfulness. So he'll say, hey, you can choose the route. You can go, and I'm going to be behind that because you're going to be faithful in the route that you go. And God is supporting that, and God is ultimately leading that. Because you've displayed faithfulness in the past. And you understand it's not about the grandeur of the thing in front of you. It's about the simplicity of faithfulness. If I can trust you with the small thing, you grant more to you. The bigger thing. And so we, we walk according to that. We walk according to God's, God's way, his revealed will, and his providential will, will will always come about. Always. So to trust that. And to trust it even if you feel like an opportunity has passed you by. And that's hard for us because we think this is the only it, this is the only answer. And if that moment goes past us, then we think, oh, that's it. What do I do now? There's no purpose for, for whatever, my existence or my occupation or whatever. Like, what do I do? That moment is gone. But you have to get to a place to where you say, Lord, if you move that out of the way, there must be something coming behind it. Because I'm trusting you in all of this. And all of this is according to your perfect plans, according to your perfect sovereignty, that if that moved past me, it was supposed to move past me. And God, what you've got in front of me is exactly what I need to be focused on because it is an if the Lord wills. That ought to be written across all of our plans. Write that on your planner. Write it on your calendar. Write it on your journal. If the Lord wills. That puts us in a place of living under the day of redemption. Now, James gives us another warning in verse 16. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, the real problem here in verse 16 is, is that such an individual not only leaves God out of the equation, but that individual actually goes on to boast about them leaving God out of the equation. It's quite an arrogant place to be. There are those in this life who take great pride in thinking that they have outsmarted God. 
because they are successful by worldly standards. They got stuff. They got notoriety. They got prestige. They got a name. But they've outsmarted God. And they've done everything they could to avoid submission to God. This is interesting. Do y'all know what the number one requested song is for people at their funeral? Now, this is non-believing, non-Christian. The number one requested song for folks at their funeral. It is I Did It My Way by Old Bill Evans. Frank Sinatra. That is the number one requested song. Now listen to what it says. This is somebody laid in a coffin, into their life. This is the words that they want saying. And now the end is here. And so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll make it clear. I'll state my case of which I am certain. I've lived my life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and more, much more. I did it my way. And then the song ends this way. For what is a man? What has he got? It's not himself that he has not. Not to say the things that he truly feels and not the words of someone who kneels. Let the record show. I took all the blows, and I did it my way. The Bible says all such boasting and bragging is evil. It is empty. It is futile. Finally, verse 17. It says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So he says, I, I've just told you all the things you ought to do. Now you need to know that if you don't go ahead and do those things that I've commanded you to do, that, that God is asking us to do, commanded us to do, then you are guilty of sinning. So the call that is issued here is a call to obey Jesus, and it is a call to obey him now. Not to delay it, but to do it right now. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. So we should not delay in obeying the commands of Jesus. If, if we know that it is good to obey the commands of Christ, then we ought to obey them. But if we don't, then that is sin. If God is calling you, according to Scripture, to be baptized, and be baptized. And he is. God is calling us to be generous and to be, to be giving. Then, then we do that. God is calling us to serve the kingdom, and so we do that. We don't delay and say, ah, i got to wait till I get to this place. No, we don't get that pass. We don't say, when I make this certain amount of money or get to this certain place in my career or hit this certain benchmark, then I'll become generous. No. We generous right now. We give of ourselves right now, our time, our talent, our treasures. We do it now. We serve the kingdom now because we're not promised the next seconds of the future. And God forbid we get to a place and we stand before him and God says, what did you do with the now? What I gave you. And you're going, ah, I was delaying the now. It doesn't work. God is calling us to action now, now faithfully. And in verse 17, you'll notice that it isn't the bad things that we're doing, but the good things that we fail to do. It's the good things that we fail to do. And when you look at Scripture, check, check this out. In the parable of the talents, remember the individual was with one talent, he was condemned by the master, not because he used the one talent for an evil purpose, but because he squandered the chance to use the one talent to do something good with it. Look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite. They're, they're pointed out not for what they didn't do, but for what they failed to do. Not for what they did do, but for what they failed to do. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You, you remember the rich man, he dies and he goes to hell and, and he's tormented in hell. And the source of his torment in hell is, is when he realizes not what he did, but what he failed to do. And he allowed his wealth to become a screen that prevented him from from having to deal with the need of people who are around him. And verse 17 is a call to face up to what we fail to do. Now, we make plans. And plans are good. But the application question here for us this morning is when you make those plans, are you accounting for God in those plans? You've got things to do. You've got places to be. But when you understand that you don't belong to you, you then take on this understanding that you represent Christ, you represent the kingdom of God wherever you go. So now, when you're going to that meeting, you're not just going to a meeting. 
You're not just traveling to North Carolina or to Tennessee for business or to Atlanta for business. You're not just doing that anymore. You're, you're not just going to the grocery store to buy groceries for your family. That's not all you're just doing. You're an ambassador of Christ. You represent the kingdom of God. And you can't determine the primary source and purpose for doing what you do. You don't get to determine that. God determines that. Because you've been bought with a price. You belong to him. And so we say, if the Lord wills. And what that means is that what whatever God's plans are for the day that he stewarded me with is, is what's going to happen, is what I'm going to do, is what I'm going to focus on. So you get to change my plans. Whatever I had in mind, you, you can change all of that because this is yours. And as we close this morning, I just I wanted to give you some practical outworkings of how this looks when we say God willing. So one, recognize what you deem as success is not necessarily the same as God's will. What we deem as success is not necessarily the same God's will. And it's easy to get that muddled with, with the world that we live in. And the world has a definition of success. But success might be going to a third world country and giving yourself up for the kingdom of God. Success might be you doing what the world says is foolishness. And you giving of pleasures and you giving of things of this world for the kingdom of God. I don't want to pursue success. I want to pursue God's will. Because that is success. Next, God's will is always the best, even if God says no. And he asks us to wait. God's no is always better than my yes. My yes could be yes to a number of things. It would be flesh driven. But if God says no, the no is good. The no is good. Next, be attentive to respond. My plans from those around me. And be attentive to respond with, with the plans that I have when it comes to understanding the importance of confirmation from those around me. So I can make a plan, but it's good to go to somebody and say, hey, this is, this is what I'm thinking. I just want to make sure. Can you help me discern the wind? Can you help me make sure that this is in line with, with obedience to Scripture, obedience to God's revealed will? And then my will is not to seek my own, but to have my will be his will. Conform your will to his. And in looking at all of this, it's just such a reminder of God's overwhelming love and promise to take care of you. Because you can look at this as, man, he's being so restrictive, and why won't God let me do what I want, and why won't he let me make my own plans and be my own self, be my best me? God is saying, you don't know what your best you even is. That is one of the most foolish things that people say. I just want to be the best version of me. Even the best version of you is jacked up. It is. Like, no, I, I want to be what he has called me to be. Even in my jacked up God is still gracious to use me and guide me along. And it's overwhelmingly clear that the love of God is so over us that he would say, hey, I, I got your plans. I got this thing figured out. Just come on. I got, I got everything you need. I got the, the providential care. I got the resources. I got the answers. Just come on right here. Trust me. I mean, what love is that? Amazing. Over what we can't even comprehend that. It's incredible. And so rest in the fact that you are cared for by a sovereign God who's got it all figured out. Don't worry about the step two, step three. Trust him for the next first step. The next first step. Father, thank you, God, for the word. Thank you for this moment, Lord. Thank you for the church. Thank you for scripture, God. Thank you that you have allowed us to come to a place to where we get to say, Deo Valente, God, if it is your will, we'll go and we'll do and we'll plan and we'll we'll move forward with life, but we want your will to 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 be the thing that God's guides us, guides the process, guides our thoughts, guides every piece. And when we submit to that and we say that, God, we trust you with the outcome, even if it's difficult, if it's hard, if it's tiresome, God, we still choose to say, your will be done. And we'll be able to look back one day, Father, when we're in your 
presence and beholding your glory in this. We're thankful, God, that we stay in a place of submission and humility. Lord, we trusted you with, with the moments, with the day, with our family, with our spouse, with our relationships, with our education, with our athletics, our academics, all those things. God, we just place those in your hands. And we thank you for your sovereignty. Thank you, God, that you cover us. Thank you that you care for us, God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you stand this morning, we're going to go back into worship and sing. And, and I just encourage you, like, embrace the role of surrender this week. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, all that I've just said and just preached, it's, it's not meant to be seen from the lens of just motivational speaking. It's not that. The words that we speak and communicate from the, the word of God are, are truth, they're life. But in truth comes a very direct application of, hey, you're going this route and you need to turn away from that way. And surrender to Christ is a turning from a life of sin, a life of death, to the king of glory, to the king of eternal life. Saying, God, I'm ready to walk in the plan that you have for me. And if you want to talk about that more, I'll be out there for you. I'd love to discuss what salvation truly looks like, what application of the gospel really looks like.